um, train with Justin and Kamloops. Uh, Justin, why don't you pop on for the intro here? There he is. All right. Um, train with Justin and Kamloops and um, great training partner came from D3 to being an Olympian. Um, knocked on that 22 meter shot put door. Awesome stuff. Um, I don't say this. I don't, I don't think I've ever said it to you, Justin, but th there was a period there where you had the best rotational technique in the world, in my humble opinion, right? Um, anyway, man, uh, welcome. Thank you for doing this, and let's get the show on the road. Thank you, Kipway. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, the best technique in the world, I, I don't know, I think there seems to be a theme that kind of follows um, what came out of Kamloops, what came out of Bonnerchuk and what he <clears throat> gave to the shot putters. Uh, and so that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today is uh, I want to share some of the cues that we use to achieve uh, what I would consider to be my rotational uh, model. And uh, can you allow me to share my screen? I've got a PowerPoint. I, wanna, I got a lot of video. I got a lot of video goodies. Right now it says one at a time. Okay. Basic. Anyway, um, so we're going to look at cues to use for specific positions uh, in critical areas in the, in the throw. And all of this is going to be based on a flat rotation model, uh, flat <coughs> uh, axis. Uh, something I like to call right around left, left around right, right around left, uh, to deliver the shot put, uh, conserving energy as much as possible. I think it should be good know. here, Justin. All right. Excellent. Okay, we got it. Yes, sir. All right. <clears throat> um, this code at the front of the screen here is not active right now. I'm going to make it active in, the, in a day or so. But uh, I think, you know, I was blown away by the uh, quality of speakers that Kipway was able to line up. And I'm also uh, impressed by the quality of people who are logged in right now. Uh, like today, I'm, I'm going to be showing video that Sean filmed at the training center of me. You know, and so just to have all of that come together, I think it's fantastic. So I want to offer a, a really big discount for people that have partaken in this. So uh, rotational shot foot, uh, why words matter. Physics cannot be ignored, and laziness is essential to mastery, okay? Uh, laziness, we're going to take that loosely in terms of mostly finding the path of least resistance and becoming very efficient at what we do. Uh, the key takeaways for today is we want uh, less speaking allows for more thinking by the athlete. You know, this is something that I learned from, from Dr. B. And, you know, we were coached in, in English second language, you know, broken English. And I asked him, I said, would you train Russian Ukrainian athletes the same way? And he said, yes. He said, he said I, I would talk a little bit more, but not really. He said, you keep cues, words to a minimum because every bit of sensory information into the athlete's brain during a training session takes away from the overall focus. So uh, the least amount of, of words gives them more time for proprioceptive recruitment. Uh, uh, and also a little side note here for why sitting is important. He would sit partly because he had a bad hip when he was old, but he would sit a lot for training sessions. And this is something I learned specifically from him is, um, I had to remind myself as a coach to stop and observe or well, be quiet, stay in one place. You know, it's like if you go out for a run or a drive, you can see the countryside, but you don't see the small things until you stop and sit in one place, right? You sit under a tree and all of a sudden the grass comes alive and you see all the insects. And, and that's what, you know, as a coach, you, you sit and be quiet and you don't move. You listen and you watch and you can get a lot more feedback from your athletes that way. Uh, less working allows for more feeling. This is where, like, for an athlete of mine, you throw, you get your implement, you come back, and you rest for 40 seconds, a minute, whatever. And there doesn't have to be talking. There doesn't have to be activity. Uh, and a lot of athletes, they, they think, uh, you know, rest time is time wasted. And 
you know, that, that, that quiet time, that reflective time is super, super important. <clears throat> and that's why keeping everything to super efficient, super focused. Uh, and then the last takeaway is jumping or lifting in the strike of the throw is inefficient and dangerous. Dangerous meaning uh, injury. Well, I guess the occasional air and throw for for uh, low-level athletes, but also uh, the injury risk to the hand from changing the direction of delivery and access to the very finish. Uh, I, I cover a lot of this um, in terms of the efficiency of the throw in a, a lecture of mine on the website. I won't take you there today, but um, we have uh, data and the historical record of, of where rotation started, where it went to in the 90s and 2000s, and where it is today, and why we have better throwing today than we did uh, 20 years ago. So cue theory, we want to focus on two to three working cues in a session. Uh, you never want to have more than that amount of input for the athlete to be working on. Uh, new cues, this is something um, I think is kind of unique maybe to my system or whatnot, but we consider, uh, we take training blocks, training cycles one at a time. And we only introduce new cues at the beginning of a new training block. And for me, I run uh, the athletes, they have a program for, say, two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, depending on whatever it is. And it's a, it's a complex, um, targeted at a specific growth. And the whole program is used as the unit of measure. So for me, my micro cycle is that whole training block. It is because that's we are measuring how much we grow from a set complex, not from just a given day. So I have maybe four mesocycles in a year and about 16 microcycles. Okay, so um, I will only introduce a new cue every new program. And you can only introduce a new cue at the beginning of a program because you won't really uh, master or you won't realize what you were doing in a current program until you change, right? Once you change, now your body has retention of what you were just working on. <clears throat> uh, old cues can be referred to as needed. So let's say, you know, you work something you were working on three months ago and the athlete does something, you know, they're a little tired and say, oh, hey, remember, you know, make sure you have the low heel. Uh, you can refer to old cues as needed. Uh, the amount of words between throws kept to a minimum. And then uh, the occasional conversation if the athlete is really struggling as to what a new concept is or something, you can pull them aside, do a demonstration, have a conversation about it. But those should be really kept to a minimum. And for me, if an athlete needs uh, side conversation every single day, um, there's there's something else going on, and, and uh, that athlete needs a little bit more of a different uh, mental focus for what they're doing during the session. Right? It's performance time when you're at the circle, it's not think time. Uh, so the four areas that we're going to look at today for the, the critical coach, you want to execute good enough technique for your athlete to, to rise in the ranks, falling on entry, over rotation or an overstep at the first uh, touchdown. Okay, so this is would be for when the right foot lands in the middle. That's the first time the foot touches the ground. Uh, early or late foot at second touchdown. Okay, that's uh, when the left foot would land up on the toe board. And then early release. Okay, um, this is where if the shot foot comes out and for a right-handed thrower and it lands in the right third sector. Or if they are throwing the shot what's coming out with their feet off the ground or before their hips and shoulders are squared to the center. And here's a picture of all these positions. This is uh, falling on entry. Uh, this is this is a young athlete out of Vermont. Uh, really, really keen. I, I was really, he's young. Uh, really impressed. I can't know, Seitler, Randall, Seitler, Hunter, Seitler. Last name Seitler. Uh, if you're a coach, you might want to be, uh, be on the lookout for this guy. This is the moment of first touchdown, second foot touchdown, and then this is uh, the moment of, of an early release. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll see the video here and how the, the ball comes out. So those um, those are kind of like the snapshots as you're coaching of wanting to see exactly what's going on at those moments. So my method of rotation here, uh, right around left, left around right, right around left. This was a training session in 2011, I think. And I was really struggling. I, I was I was throwing far, but I was really struggling with exactly how to get my body through and have a lot of good throws per session. Right, that, that's when you really reach your level of, of 
mastery is when you don't have five good throws a session, you have 18 out of 20 good ones. And he, he said, stop. And he, we had one of those little sidebars, and he showed me, he like, drew out with a stick across the circle of like where your feet go, where your hips go um, on the path. And I looked at this, and I thought, this is the path of backwards three. And I came to my mind that Brian Oldfield always talked about the backwards seven. At least for my, I think my first exposure to that is with Brian Oldfield. Um, and so we want to move on a backwards three down the backwards seven. This is something unique that uh, I have pulled from my time in Campbell's Safana Trip and that I still maintain in my business. Your legs should remain bent almost the entire time up until the final moment of release. Um, we are focused on using the sides of our body. This is something. Um, uh, I have other presentations that focus more on how we do this, but uh, I don't separate the hips and the shoulders. We bifurcate the body uh, down the middle, so you have a left side and a right side, and that's how we generate force. Uh, <clears throat> so focus on creating core, yeah. So you know, your legs remain bent all the time, and then uh, we're really focused on having the maximum amount of force development during double support, and whenever you are in zero or single support, you are minimizing extra movement, okay? You can still be engaging muscles, but you cannot be moving limbs around uh, independent from the axis of rotation when you're in support. That's all about cons conservation of energy. If you move anything while in support, you're gonna slow down the rotation. Uh, rotations and strike are kept as flat out of the axis as possible. Uh, we wanna be very, I guess some people call it maybe being a little bit linear in the horizontal plane. A lot of times we talk about linear being across the circle, but we wanna be you know, wide circles around uh, around the vertical axis here. Um, and your body can never go up from the starting point. You either stay on the same plane or you can go down as you rotate, but you can never come up higher than where you started. So those are kind of common themes. All right. Here we've got a nice little shirtless throw from Kamloops, uh, one of the great throwing throwing venues I've ever trained at. Now, uh, we talk about having a flight, a flat strike. Yeah, I think we, have, we all know that you know, like 35 degrees or so is, is the ideal release angle for the shot put. Uh, I encourage my athletes to aim a little lower because there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a gap between what your conscious executes and what actually physically happens. And so for me, I learned at this facility here, from this perspective, I would always aim for right at the top of the hillside there, right at the tree line was my my mental and visual focal point of where I was going to push the ball to, right? which is maybe 25 degrees, maybe less. Okay? And then the ball would always come out around 30 degrees. Uh, and pushing the implement flat is always going to be better, especially in the shot, but there's no flight dynamics going on. Like you're basically throwing that shot in the vacuum. Uh, the faster you can push it for distance before gravity takes it is going to give you the best result. It's all about release speed. So this video, here we have the yellow line is the backward seven, which is where the feet fall and contact the ground. The yellow lines here, you see how the hips and feet follow a backward street path up the front. So this is from the entry here, you see the right side moves around the left. The left is the central point of axis, the central point of pivot at the start. Right moves around it. Then when in the middle, the right becomes the center point of axis, and the left moves around this. Now, the key with this is we don't want to be pulling that left leg into the body, okay? If you pull that leg, left leg into the body, you will speed up until you're ready to put the foot down. When you put the foot down, you're going to extend the leg again, and when you extend the limb away, you will slow rotation. You slow rotation right before double support, and then you will lose, the, the shot foot is going to move ahead of your body, and you will have an early release. So this is a lot about why we want to keep the same position. And then the the uh, top curve here, oops. Uh, and mouse doesn't want to work in this format. I was kind of counting on that, that's all right. Uh, at the top there you see the, um, this is where the right side is coming back around the left side again. We post up on the left leg, and then the right shoulder finishes forward and around of the left side. Uh, so that's right around left, left around right, right around left. Three flat rotations.
Now this here is talking about the, the vertical axis. We've got the, the green line there showing the uh, center point of balance at the start. And then by the time you finish, the release should happen near that same point of reference. So that shows that you are delivering the shot put balanced all the way down the middle of the circle. The yellow lines here are showing you how the hips and shoulders never go above the starting point. Okay, now from the, from the rear view, there's a little bit of, you know, the body's getting further away, so you can't quite see it as well. But the idea is that we want to rotate flat and let the body come down to bent legs. We do not want to extend our legs to find the ground. Always going flat and down, never up. Uh, the red circles show you the key moments of how the legs stay bent all the way through the circle. And again, the white lines here giving you the backwards three, right around left, left around right, right around left. So the considerations in the entry, we have a 50-50 weight distribution between the legs at the windup. Okay, uh, I know uh, so there's some people out there who like to preload the the left leg. Uh, I guess some on the right, but most of the left, because they say it helps them get around their left better, right? It helps them to, to be on balance, right? I think I remember hearing Mac talk about being on balance, on balance. I never understood what he meant until I reached a certain level of mastery, and I understood what being, being means being on your central point of uh, pivot all the time. Not just having good balance on a leg, but actually rotating from a single point. And so I say, instead of loading to a single limb, try narrowing your stance. Okay, you can you can go wider or narrower, and that at, at your startup, and that'll change a lot of your technique issues. If you go narrower, you uh, decrease the distance that you have to push the ball and get onto your central point of pivot, and so it's easier for you to get in the circle balance just by going narrower. Okay, that also has a lot of benefits of making you use the right side more on entry. We'll get into that, but so some of the cues I say for people. When, like as an athlete is getting ready to get in the circle, this is when they get the cues. And so on these slides here, you have uh, the cues are in orange. So you, you say 50-50, or you, can, or you can do a finger gesture. Well, the video now, you, you, you just sit there and you just do this. And the athlete will know, right, I got to line up two inches narrow, right? Or you can you know, have your fingers go out, or you can just say the word, you can say narrow or wider um, right before they get in the circle. On the entry, you want to have open palm. Let's see, I've got a few slides. Yeah. All right. So what was the last one? 50-50 weight distribution. Yeah. So 50-50 weight. Oh, there we go. We got on my last one. 50-50 weight distribution here. We need to get the ball on top of the left toe. Okay, this is Brian Krauser here on the right, and we're using Seitler again for our example here. Uh, ball must shift on top of the left toe before you can lead double support. Because once you leave, you have lost your ability to build force once this foot comes up. So you need to get to your most efficient rotation position before that leaves. And here we see Rand, he's about ready to pick, pick his foot up, and his ball is still behind. So this is the importance of being either narrower, so you can get more easily over that toe, or being disciplined and pushing yourself out, leaning out over that toe before you leave. Uh, open palm, thumb down. <clears throat> this is something that drives me really nuts uh, when I see, I guess, you see it a lot more in women because you don't need to be as strong or forceful to throw the 4K ball. But I would want an open palm, this left arm, open palm, thumb down, swipe the air, pull body around with the left arm. Okay, and those cues would be thumb down, open hand, or use left, use left arm. And here we have... Uh, the view, it's kind of hard to see in, in this exact slide, but Ryan has his hand open and his thumb down, and he's using that arm to pull himself around, pull himself over the left foot, uh, and have a lot of energy coming into the point of location. Uh, and over here we see this, this cupped hand, the thumb up, and it, it, uh, there's no force there. There's nothing pulling the body in, because uh, we need to clear the side. We'll, we'll talk about clearing the side as we get into the middle here. And then, uh, yeah, lean over the, le the left toe, ball over toe before it go. Okay, this is this would not be the cue that I would use. That's kind of important to remember. Any position that you are uh, 
uh, rotating in, you must have the ball over the toe, toe knee, and the shoulder the ball all in the same place. Um, and then for that point, I'd just say ball on toe, two corner, or reach left. Okay, this is something to get them to use that left arm more too. Uh, we say 90 and go. The left foot will point at 90 degrees. At this point, you reach out with the left arm and the left shoulder to pull that ball over the toe. And then that's when you use your right leg, you find your hip to kind of, it's almost like a little bit of a skateboard kick to get off the ground and come around. But the point is we are reaching out, we say the corner. You want to get the right hip and the right shoulder as far across this midline as you can. So ideally you would have a mirror image from your start position to your 180 position. Your hip would be the exact same distance away from the midline as it is here. Uh, now we have considerations in the middle. Uh, we're going to get the video in a few slides to cover all this. Uh, in the middle, you want to have your low feet as you go through the, sec uh, through the circle. Low, low, low feet. Uh, and on the entry, I think I missed this on the, on the first one, but you want to have a low left heel. Okay, on, on your entry, this low left heel will keep you balanced. If someone asks you to stand uh, to balance on one foot, you're not going to keep your heel six inches off the ground. You're going to keep it real low, right? Stability is really key in the entry, and so we want to cue the athletes to keep that foot, look, that heel low. Go back. You see here, Ryan. Yeah, I missed that green, that green circle. His heel is super, super low to the ground, and as we watch the video, you'll see it drag just above the ground here. Uh, if that heel picks up, it's going to push the knee forward, the knee forward at the toe, and then you are going to fall in on your entry. Um, let's see. You want to have the feet dorsi flat because they're coming into the first, the first touchdown. Spin flat, down to step, right? Down to step is talking about you, know, you rotating on a flat position, but you're never going to let yourself come up. Uh, right hip and thigh are going to pull the body into the middle. A lot of people will, will want to jump off the left leg here or jump off the left foot to keep that left bent, and you use the inside of the right thigh and the right hip to pull yourself forward into the middle. This maintains a really true or honest rotation aspect into the first step. Uh, at first touchdown, ball and toe must be together. Okay, you're going to have the shot foot and the toe and the knee all stacked on top of each other at the moment of touchdown. And the cues for that would be land together or turn right hip. I find right before touchdown, if you cue the athlete to turn, turn the right hip into the step, that at least keeps them rotating at the point of touchdown. You never want to crash and stop at that, at that touchdown and be rotating through it. Um, second touchdown must have a heel strike. Okay, when, that, when that second foot comes down, you're going to get the toe first. You have to come into a mid, mid foot and heel touch for at least one frame of film. Uh, and then you're free to go back into the toe for the strike. Uh, this, this heel contact rounds the body on the left side. It shifts the point of central weight of the torso more forwards. And it gives you the, the point to rotate the release arm around. Uh, if that if that heel does not come down, almost always the ball is going to come out early. And for that, I, I tell my athletes push with your hip through the heel. Use the left hip to push the foot down, uh, push the body down into the bent leg anyway. And then uh, open left leg. A lot of times, just coincides with having an open left hip and an open uh, leg at the point of touchdown. And here again, we see the open palm thumb down position. Okay. And this is what we don't want to be doing. What this does is we're trying to get the right leg, the right side of the body into the middle. Well, what's in the way? The left side is in the way. So you must rotate the left shoulder, the left hip out of the way. So the right can sit forward. If it's not out of the way, you have to go up and over it. And this is where athletes jump out of the back because they have to go literally over themselves. Use the left arm, completely turn that left to get out of the way that the right can go take through. Uh, and then this is showing the bent left leg here. Okay, you want to be pulling right leg, pulls you off the bent left. This never extends and pushes. And we want to have 90 degrees with the shoulder and torso here. Uh, and then this line is just showing he's got a nice 
90 degree here, but his leg is straight, so we don't have the little hitch down here. That also is pushing him. His ball is not as close to his center of rotation. Let's see if we get all of that. Yeah. Okay, and now this this slide here will be a demonstration. The little yellow arrows are considering the height differences uh, between the ground and the athlete. Um, here we say that's another thing is good rotators. Um, their zero support phase, their flight time is maybe a frame or two uh, of, of video. You're going to see them uh, right after that left foot leaves, the right's going to go down right. They spend hardly any time in the air at all. Uh, and then this is a good example of showing this left arm clearing out of the way before the right comes down. This left arm, he's catching his, you need to catch your left arm in the middle. But if you, if you catch it here, you haven't completed the rotation here, right? He hasn't completed his right side rotation to get down and balance, and he's already getting in his own way. So he's slowing down. He's slowing himself down. He can't, he can't get through his left arm. Let that left arm clear all the way around before the right touches. And then this is the point of second point touchdown. Okay, and here we want to see the ball right over top of the, the right toe, which he does pretty well here. And then we want to see the... Uh, Toe down to heel strike, grounding the left. We don't have that over here. And then the other thing, too, is when you put that heel down, that forces the hip, right the hip in the back of the shoulder, straight down over that toe. And that's going to create a lot more separation, stretch reflex, in the of that ball. Now we have considerations of the strike. Uh, double support is critical in delivery of implement. You have to accelerate the implement with both feet on the ground. If you don't, you are losing power. It's just straight physics. Um, if, if you are releasing the ball and you are at one foot on the ground or you are in midair, you are losing. Now, a common argument I hear is, well, I have a 700-pound push press, so I don't need that. Well, that might be fair enough. If you're a super, super strong athlete, yeah, maybe you don't need that double support. But for the 98% of other athletes in the world, you need both feet on the ground to support the shoulder torso striking system. Okay, this is at the front of the circle. We'll talk about this, but the hips cannot get in front of the shoulders at the finish of the throw. It's nigh impossible, nor is it very strong. Go out to the weight room, grab a plate, and try and do a plate twist, right? Pull your plate back to where you would have your discus or your shot foot, turn your hips forward away from the point of rotation, and then twist that plate around yourself and see how strong you are. And then do it again and leave your hips behind. Let the shoulders go first. As the shoulders pass the hips, then let the hips and the feet follow in support of the shoulders pushing the plate. And that's how you're strong. Okay, that's how you apply force to an arm. <clears throat> Land on bent legs. And at this point, the upper body takes over. The torso and the shoulders are the throwing engine. The legs are just following in support. Uh, so we have hold the ground. You want to like be grabbing the ground. This is something I got from Dane Miller. He would talk about grabbing the ground with your toes in the shoe. I kind of like that. I would always talk about having a really wide toe box. Right? In the toe box of the shoe, you want to be really wide and flat up there. Uh, you tell the athlete, keep bent or a lunge step. So a lunge step is something I tell people when they're first being introduced to this uh, bent leg throwing system. And it's, uh, uh, at that final position, you want that right knee to be able to float past the, left, the right toe a little bit. And you end up being in something that's like a lunge position, even though you're rotating through it. Balance must be uh, on the left leg. You saw that in the last slide. Uh, throwing from the left side increases torque. Uh, we tell, tell the athlete, land on left, keep bent left leg, keep bent left leg. A lot of times they'll, they'll land bent, and then they'll want to jump straight out of it. Or we say, go to left. Meaning shift your weight on the left foot. Now, shifting weight on the left foot doesn't negate that you come off your right. So you have the, that right contact as you're rotating. Um, strike with whole shoulder across the midline of the body. Shoulders are the engine of the legs. Um, and the whole shoulder complex, right? The hand and the arm are weak. The shoulder is very, very strong. The shoulder is also connected to your torso. And so wherever the shoulder goes, the body will also turn. So if you rotate the shoulder forward and around, the body's going to do that, so you'll maintain your right around left action there. Um, strike flat and around. Continue final. A lot of times you see people go land 
and as soon as the double squat, they say, okay, now I'm ready to throw, and then, and then they, they kind of pause, and they redirect their body, and they want to go up. We say, don't do that. Just as soon as you land, keep the rotation going, keep going through your final. Don't change the axis, don't change the attitude. And missed. Uh, lifting implement, yeah, I mean, so we have, yeah, no prepare, forward and around, push flat. If they want to keep changing the axis, so don't prepare. Don't don't get ready for the final. Just continue straight through. And so here uh, we see the importance of keeping the legs the same attitude the whole time. Wherever the body is rotating, the feet follow. Okay. Uh, this athlete, they kept their right foot back. You need to be weight ball and the weight straight up on top of that toe and it stays back until this foot down. Once the foot is down, the left, then the right is free to start traveling forward. Also the head, the head must be on the midline. There's two points where the head can leave the midline. One is on the entry, you can look over your shoulder and help yourself get in. And then at the very, very final moment of release, you can pull the head left again. Otherwise it stays glued right on your midline. It does not move the space of the shot foot. You cannot look ahead. And here again, we're looking at the eyes, even once the foot down, and we, this is the beginning of the strike. The strike begins with the face looking to the side, ball still back behind, left shoulder all the way up front, rounded, bent legs. We're not grounded over here, we're still back behind. And again, this is the importance of having the heel contact the ground, is you get the entire left side is stacked right up on the top of it. If the heel's not down, you'll have a little bit of an angle in the, in the torso. And then the final moment before the ball comes off, here we see both feet in contact with the ground supporting this massive engine system, pushing flat out. You want the shoulders straight, hips straight, 90 degrees in the torso. And then sometimes you'll see this athlete's leg will, will be out a little bit or in a little bit. You want as straight a line as possible here. Um, now, if you see on the left here, you see the athlete's uh, arm is down at less than 90 degrees. If you don't see a jump, you know they are lifting if you see this arm fall like this. Because okay? what happens is they start with their arm out here. They start with their arm at 90, and then as they lift their body, their shoulder isn't strong enough to keep their left arm up with their body. So the body pushes past the arm, and that's where you get the arm down position. That's a really easy one for coaches to see. You see the arm come down and you know right away they're lifting. Okay, so here we have some video courtesy of Sean from years and years and years ago. I think this was 2012, the Olympic year. Uh, and we, we were using this, it's good video, but it's also, we got the video of Ryan. So we've got, they're not the same circle, but they're right next to each other. It's kind of nice for point of reference. Um, so this is just, I put the dots in here to show the path of the feet. We're not really too concerned about the path of the feet. It's more about the path of the hips and shoulders. Um, and then the, the white dots are the path of the shot foot, and the blue dots are the path of the left shoulder. Okay. And so this is just for the more scientific-minded people. You can kind of see the, the relationship of the body and the size of the lower body rotation. Okay. We're looking for these big, massive rotation path on the bottom and as we work up those uh, paths become shorter uh, this is something I, I saw in like late 90s early 2000s growing is we actually had a, a reverse we saw smaller uh, smaller paths in the bottom and larger paths in the shoulders and the shot foot um, so here, we're going to see a nice execution of that low left heel out of the back bent legs. You see this right leg and right hip are pulling the body rotationally forward into the first step. That left arm's clearing. You see how that left arm clears all the way around for the right to come down. And then again, at the strike, what we're doing is at the point of double support, you are clearing that left side before the right can come through. 
you always must clear the side. Clear left side, right comes through, clear, clear, and then out, straight, straight to the front. Now here we have Ryan, one circle over, probably four or five years later. Now bear in mind, these are training groups, right? So we're not saying these are perfect examples by any means. But here you see Ryan, his, uh, his foot and hip pads are a little bit shorter than the previous video. We see his feet come up a little bit higher, it might be because he's a bit taller than an athlete. But his shot foot path is much wider at the top, okay? Now well, something interesting I see with, with this video is Ryan, as he comes to the front, he actually lifts a little bit, and that, I'd say that ball comes out a little early for him. You'll see he does not get grounded on his left. Uh, he touches the left, but then he kind of keeps pushing through the right side, and you don't see a nice stacked 90-degree line straight down to his, to his foot here. Uh, I think on his better throw, you, you do see that. Here's a look at a non-reverse throw. I, I pretty much, I, I put this in just, I think, uh, Throws University shared this video. It's going to have a lot of uh, hits and views this week, so I thought maybe it was cute, but see another representation of it. Again, that yellow line showing the path of balance, and that we want to always be you know, landing on that path and releasing off that central path. Flat, flat, flat rotations. You see the right leg pull off left. That left comes off bent and it lands bent. When that left leg comes off the ground on entry, it does not change position. It holds position here, holds, 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 and the body pushes that leg into the ground. Okay, you do not move that leg independent of the body. The body pushes that leg into the ground. From the moment of takeoff on, on the entry, body pretty much holds the exact same position. The only thing you're doing is you are stopping that left arm in the back and letting the body catch it so you can pull it back around again to the final. Here's a, the athlete we saw before. And here, now in the younger athletes, you're going to see a lot more up and down variation with their leg sweeps. It's a much much more pivoted axes, they're not as flat. And you also can see a lot more discrepancy in the blue and white lines where they are pulling their, their, their shoulders up and down more and that uh, shot foot path is not going to be as wide okay, because they are moving over top of, each, of themselves. Right? And anytime you, you move over top of yourself, you shorten the path that you can go around that central axis. Very, very important to keep the hips and shoulders level at all times. Move around yourself not over top of yourself. Here's our Seitler athlete out of Vermont again. And here you see nice big, now this is an example, he really falls in on this on this grow. When you fall in, he has to pull that left side up and over top of himself. Then he doesn't ground himself at the finish, and he kind of jumps up through, and that's where you see that ball come out to the right here. Now I will say our um, improving athlete models here today are, are still exceptional. Uh, you know, Megan Tomei, she uh, threw 1725 in the indoor season this year uh, in a competition and um, Seitler here for his age, she's one of the more advanced throwers I've ever seen. Uh, and so we're, you know, we're, I mean, I'm giving you some pretty polished examples. All right, uh, I didn't get to do any lines on this one, but this is uh, Terrence Study, 1787. Uh, again, from the Olympic Training Center. I'm not sure who took this video. My bet would be on Sean again. Uh, and this, this is just showing you a very flat, right? She's got these flat paths through the cir circle, flat, 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 and then up and out, up and out. This one's playing a little, I'm not sure why this is playing fast. This one should be going a little bit. He was a good example of 
She's a little bit late here. She's fallen in. Okay, this is another example from the side position here. Wherever this left hip is at the start, it needs to stay here. It cannot fall in again. And I'd say, right, she kind of pushes that hip just a little bit too much toward the board. And then that has her angling in a bit here. So she's fallen in a bit. Also, with my athlete, when the left is at 90 here, you say 90 and go. As soon as you hit 90, the left arm should be here with the toe. And that's when the right foot picks up and that right hip and thigh start pulling you around. Okay, so she's late here. So I would give her the cue of 90 and go or reach the corner. And then she's got a nice cleared left side. Here, her thigh is open. Her thigh is open, pulling in, which is nice. And then when she lands, okay, now she's she's leaning in and she's reaching a bit with this step, okay. Uh, she, she, I guess she fell in. She didn't get as, as uh, orbital with this foot path. And because she wasn't as orbital, it went further through the circle, and now you see it's landed. Her toe is out here, and her ball is inside of the toe. This will kill your your momentum, right? Now the ball has to catch up. It's going to slow the rotation down. At this position, you want that toe under the ball. And then she kind of reaches a little bit coming into the second step. She reaches with that left foot to put it down, uh, which causes her to open up a bit reaching for that position and she stands up. So she stands up, it's a little too open and then her strike is not as long as it could be. And it, 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 this one came out early. Um, but in terms of striking position, not too bad. Double support, fairly bent legs, everything in alignment here. We would like to see that just a little bit lower, but overall not bad. Okay, now we've got um, five or six, seven, uh, drill videos here. I think we're about getting close on time anyway. So this is a drill that I invented. Um, at least I've never seen it anywhere else. Vertical broom drill. Okay, uh, This is a rake, but you know, kind of whatever you have in the circle. It works nice with something at the top, like a broom or a rake to give some resistance or weight at the top. The athlete has to hold the handle tight to their hip bone and tight to their shoulder. If it's not tight to the body, this doesn't work, okay? And then you have them just do a throw. And if you're trying to teach an athlete how to rotate their body right around left, left around right, on these flat axes, make them do this. If they hold the implement tight to their body, they have no choice but to execute this technique without falling off, okay? Because it ties everything straight together. And you have to clear one side to get the other side around. If you're doing this with discus, you can uh, just hold the broom straight out on an angle, and it gets the same effect. Okay? So this is sometimes a lot at the circle, but athletes have trouble really falling and diving. I'll just say, yep, go do five rooms. They come back and they're finished. Okay, shot swing drill. This is excellent at teaching the athlete how to use the shoulder forward and around at the finish, okay? Um, we just released the, uh, the the red sling, the rotary explosive device. Uh, in the fall, we will be releasing a system to hang uh, these slam balls for this exercise. Uh, this is one of the best exercises you can do for shot put. It teaches the athlete to not go up in the final because that ball is on a fixed release point, so they have to come in to the position that you want, bent leg position in order to get a good strike. Uh, we use a slam ball. Yeah, I see there's like shot put attachments for lifting racks and stuff, and it's all these little things. Or I see some programs have their own shot swings, but they've got like weight balls or um, outdoor weight steel balls on these things. And you cannot do that. You the forces applied in this drill. You, it's all about overspeed, right? You want to move faster than you normally do. You want, it's a strength building exercise. You need a large ball, you need a soft ball to strike, to apply more force to the implement than you would normally on a shot foot, right? More surface area, more force. So this exercise has to be done with a, with a, a wide soft ball. 
Uh, throws of the shotgun glove. Okay, this one doesn't play out of math. Okay. Uh, doing overweight throws, yes, is good for development, but also looking, teaching the athlete to do new things or to chase the throw more forward, further around. Um, you can avoid injury if you use a glove. Um, the video I'm going to show you, the lighting is not great, but that's what happens when you take, try to capture something in the field. It's just not always perfect. Um, this is a 20-pound ball. It's a 9K shot. Okay? And I get a little excited. I dive in in the middle. And I get a little rush finish. I don't ground it. But I'm showing this today because the sheer release velocity of the 20-pound ball is um, is is crazy. It, it's a huge amount of force coming off the hand. And it's this force came from transfer of energy, right? Throwing with these flat rotations. And if I didn't have the glove on this throw, I would have made mincemeat out of my hand because there's so much force involved there. Um, let's see if I can pause it. It's getting a little bit glitchy on us here. Coming out. So, yeah, I I don't use the right leg enough here, okay? So right at the point of entry, that right leg should be pulling me more. I kind of end up diving a little bit, and I'm not – I end up falling into this position just a little bit. Uh, and then because I'm, I fell, I have more forward momentum than I want. I don't have as, as much rotational energy. And then when I hit this position, I'm, I'm already – it's already going at this point. I don't have time to ground myself and continue that right side around left rotation. And then uh, the, the ball ends up get, getting away from me a little bit here. But I want to show this, this position here, okay? This is what power looks like. If you are throwing, this is what a delivery position needs to look like. Bent legs supporting a huge rotating trunk. And then you can have explosive explosive releases. Discus final drill. Um, again, here we're using this, the early prototype of the, the red sling. Uh, this is great exercise. This is a 30-pound ball here. Uh, I would not recommend a lot of people use 30 pounds. Uh, but this teaches the athlete to deliver force in a, from a balanced position. and pushing that side around the left. Again, we're, I'm showing this to you to show the point of clearing a side before delivering, clearing the left side before delivering the right side, the importance of bent legs, right? Bent leg, bent leg, bent leg. This is, this is force transfer. If you are taller, if you are leaning back, there is no force transfer, right? Again, look at this back leg. The back leg shifts, but it doesn't really push, okay? That back leg is following the system of the throw. The system of the throw is grounded on the left, and the body is rotating the shoulders and the arms around for the delivery. These are all great ways to get the athlete moving in the way you want. Okay, um... That's it for the content. Uh, I guess I'll take questions now. I'm sure there's some questions on some of the specific content. Okay, so Justin, I'll pop in just for a second. I know yep. um, one question was about PowerPoint. You specifically Will you um, make the PowerPoint available? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll make it available. And and for everyone else that's listening, like that's I'm I'm not going to be the one to make now the audio um, or the link to these presentations. Like that's that's good. That comes with the registration, but. Um, as 
as Sean pointed out, um, this is their intellectual property. So it'll be up to the individual presenters if they would like to share their uh, their slides. Yeah, I th I'll tell you what. Uh, I'll make everybody a deal. I say I'll, I'll 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 give the PowerPoint to you in email or uh, on Drive if they make a purchase from my website. How about we do that? So I, I've got lectures for ten bucks, or the two shops for fifteen dollars, and so if they want to support me uh, through the website. Um, and they just let me know that they were part of the uh, the Throats Consortium, and then I'll I'll send them the PowerPoint that way. Right. Cool. Um, thank you for doing that. And second question that I received, and then um, everyone else for more questions. Let's do the hand raising feature, and um, and I'll be able to cue you in to ask your questions of Justin. Um, for taller athletes, this is from Jeffrey. For taller athletes, you generally see the mode like Ryan, smaller pass on the bottom with larger pass for the upper body, mm -hmm. lower versus upper pass model. Yeah, um, I think com comparatively, now I, I haven't done any scientific measurements on the ratios between those paths, but um, yeah, the taller athletes, they can lean over more, right? So they, they can shoot that ball out there a bit more just from the sheer height of them. But I would say the taller athletes who rotate well, um, you don't see a whole lot of difference between them and short athletes, except the fact that they look like they're going slower because they're able to go on longer pathways. Well, they have to go on a longer path. And so they, they appear to move slower, but everything else should be pretty much the same as compared to uh, a short athlete. I was a short athlete. I'm, I'm, I'm only like six feet tall. There weren't many guys shorter than me. Um, yeah. I also I also approach discus the same way. Uh, you know, uh, stall stall moves a lot like this. Stall's got really great technique. Uh, all the a lot of the discus, discus greats do. They're big tall guys, so you see a slight variations, but um, in general, it, it, it's all still there. Some more questions for Justin. All right, well, I've got one. Um, so uh, as far as from, so from an athlete's perspective, when someone shows up to you like day one, first day, what do you focus on? Like, what what would you do for that athlete for them to see improvement? Uh, first thing is I, I start them on bent leg, bent leg stand throws, uh, understanding to throw with the shoulders more than, than the legs. And then... Uh, if they're fairly new to rotating, I take them straight to um, half spins usually because uh, a half spin moving like this will uh, make them you, it's easier to understand how to move one side independent from the other. You know, so the half spin will say, okay, turn your right shoulder and your right hip until your back is facing the sector and then your left foot can leave. And we rotate it on a low foot, wide path. We follow the ring of the circle around the toe board again. And that's a great inter introduction to place for the athletes to understand what we're after in terms of how we're going to use our body to throw. Bent leg stands, and then you know, that half spin. Keeping the legs bent, forcing the left foot to go wide, low, and around. Um, it is a great starting point. Yeah, I like that. Um, here's a question from Nick. Could you explain why dorsiflexion is so important a little more? Well, dorsif it, it puts a little bit of tension in the legs, so, so you can feel your muscles. And when you can feel your muscles, you can use them better. At least that's a theory I have. I, I always, when I had a little bit of soreness, they have a meet, I knew I was going to throw well because I, I had more proprioceptive 
knowledge in my body. I can feel more muscle, right? Um, also, the dorsiflexion, if you keep them, keep your toes up, you have to bring the body down to the foot. You can't reach for the touchdown. And then if you're not reaching for the touchdown, you're not going to be cheating the timing of your rotations. Right? You're not going to stop the body high and be in a position where your heel's too high. You let the body come down to dorsiflexion, low heel, and you just maintain your balance through that position. All right, from Mary, could you explain a little bit more about the placement of the shot over the left foot out of the back of the ring before the right foot hits, or lifts, sorry. Uh, so this is, it, it, it's something where it happens in a dynamic phase, right? You're moving, and so it's not something that is going to be, let's go to a video. Um, it's not something that is, it's not going to be a stop position. So when I have athletes learning this, I will, I will make them do the position. I'll say, keep your feet on the ground and lean out and push your foot or push the ball out over the toe. Okay. In this example here, we, we see that I don't exactly get the ball all the way out there. I guess I'm not really rotating on the toe. I'm kind of on the side of my foot. But um, I'll, I'll have the athlete just lean out. Ideally, we'll, we'll go with left foot at 90, left arm at 90, and then I have them lean out, fall over the toe while keeping the ground contact with the right foot. And that teaches them the position that they need to feel. And this also allows them, by the ball coming out, it pushes them out over the corner. Okay, And this is something... Um, Two is young athletes need to understand that throwing on a four foot board, or just a sheet of plywood, is great because it gives you a visual visual representation of where the center axis is. And so I'll tell athletes on a board, you need to feel like you are rotating out over the grass. You feel like you're rotating out on the edge of the board, off the board. And this is the starting position gets them to start feeling that idea of getting out away from their from their left toe on, on the point of entry. Um, once once you get the ball over the toe, at that point you're just focused on having the right hip move as far out away from your left toe as you, as you can get. You want to get that right side as far out. You don't necessarily need to focus on the shot from getting far out per se. It's mostly about the hip. Um, but uh, I think that's about all I could say. I'm going to have a follow-up. The big thing on getting that ball out over the toe here is you have to keep that left arm continuing to open. And so that, that way you don't get stuck here, right, where the body can rotate around that point. Because you're setting up a path of least resistance, right? You want to have a, a quick, easy, balanced entry. But if the ball is over top, there's, no, there's not going to be a resistance to that axis. The ball is inside you're going to end up having to pull your right side up and over this, this access point to get in, keep things rotating, keep things moving so it's all clear, you get in fast. Left foot to 90 and reaching with the left arm does a lot to help an athlete on their start. Okay, and... Thomas asks, how would you get an athlete to move their left leg faster from the back of the circle to the front of the circle? I would increase the rotation of the right hip and shoulder at touchdown. Okay, the, the more that right side is rotating at touchdown, the faster that left is going to snap through. Okay, that's where half spins are really good for learning this, this dynamic. Because the harder you pull with the right side, the faster that left is going to follow, right? And uh, I would also say keeping the foot low, right? Forcing the athlete. You don't want to see this this uh, knee, this heel kick up to the butt. You don't want to see the knee squeeze together um, because they're going to get they're going to get faster to here, 
but then they're going to be slower getting the foot down. And when that slows down, the shot foot keeps up speed, the shot foot's going to come out early. Um, yeah, so that's the main, the main thing is, and also the faster that foot, the left comes off, the faster it can get down. Another reason for coming off of that left is if, let's see, let's put a if you extend that left leg, the toe is going to stay on the ground longer just by the rule, right? Because you're moving away, but the foot's staying on the ground. If the foot's on the ground, it can't come forward. Yeah, there we go. You know, so that's another way to speed it up. Make sure they get off when it's bent, and then it's going to be traveling. You know, if it comes off while it's bent, that right will naturally come down sooner, and it's going to start coming forward faster. Okay, so just possibly one, maybe two more questions here um, from Alan, I believe. Sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name properly. With more experienced athletes who come to you, how long do you take to get to know how they move and why they move that way? And when do you introduce new cues to them? Uh, usually, right away, I can tell exactly what kind of type of training system they had, exactly what kind of throwing they did like within two throws. So just seeing them move, seeing them warm up, seeing them pick up their shot put, I know exactly what they've done. Um, I would say, like for an athlete that I was going to train as a professional, to find out every nuance that I would need to control everything in a yearly cycle, it would take two years to completely learn that athlete. Uh, to, to really understand how they move, I would say it takes me probably a month or two of really just observing them. And what I'll do is... Like every two weeks, I'll give them a new stimulus package, a new a new system, and see how they react to it. And after about four or five rounds, then I, I can really understand like their weak strengths, weaknesses, how they react to different things. Um, yeah, so I'd say about four to five complexes, uh, training blocks, and then I have a pretty good idea. Was there a second part of that question? Uh, no, I think or... that uh, one just popped through. So from Jamar, explain applying these cues to discus technique. Uh, so discus, um, when I first heard it, I thought it was absolutely crazy. I think I've heard you remark on a two kid way of push the discus, uh, how it, um, it didn't really make sense, but so we talk about pushing the right side, using the right side to pull you, pull yourself in. In the discus, I do cue the athletes uh, to, we don't want to be dragging that discus the entire time. At some point, you need an active right shoulder to be pulling that discus with you. If not, get it a little bit ahead of your body on the corner uh, here. Get it a little bit ahead on the corner to get, because uh, that can aid you, to, like, aid your, the momentum of it can aid you to get into the middle faster, okay, with more rotation. Uh, other than that, I would say in, in my discus throwers, I do allow for a little bit more of a, a linear step out of the back, okay, we're not so much concerned about rotating all the way out to the corner on the entry, we do let um, a little bit more of a fall in with the shoulder, we still have a bent left, but you can kind of kick that right leg up a little bit and, and linearly sweep it in a bit more. This tend to be taller athletes. I think it also helps to keep the discus in balance because uh, it's, it's way out there. Uh, other than that, everything else is the exact same. Uh, the only thing that doesn't quite apply is the implement being on top of center of balance. Uh, I approach that with the the shoulder has to be on top of the center point of balance. Uh, that's the only thing I look at for distance throwers in, in those positions. Uh, 
Yeah, that that's yeah, that's probably because the center of gravity is a lot further away. Yeah. So, um, Sean asks, who do you think is the best technician out there right now? In uh, uh shot, but you can I don't know. Yeah, shot for sure. Oh. I, whenever I ask this question, I always want to say somebody who's on like the B level, right? Because I think the best technicians are probably the people who aren't necessarily throwing the furthest. Uh, I, I always want to say somebody in the NCAA or something, uh, especially with, with the women. Because I think women have better technique when they're not throwing as far, uh, at least from a, from a global perspective. And then when asked that, I always have a hard time coming up with names. Uh, I think. For a tall athlete, I think what Ryan Krauser is doing is uh, somewhat revolutionary in the sport. Of course, right now, it, years ago, like let's say 2020, I'm getting old. Six, six to eight years ago, I had a hard time watching throwers because I didn't think anybody had good technique. There was very, very little good technique. There's a lot of good technique now. Everybody has a really good technique. Uh, and so, any of the top five guys are moving pretty well. Uh, I really like what uh, Ponzio is doing at Ponzio. I think that's how you say that name. I really like how he's developing. I'm very curious to see what, what he'll do. Um, I, I like Joe Kovacs' technique. Uh, I don't like, I think he lifts a little bit too much out of the back and he doesn't get his heel down. Um, but uh, discus for me, uh, I, I'm pretty clear. There's only two people in the discus that I really like right now, and that's uh, Daniel Stahl. And then I can't think of his name right now, but there's a, oh, there's a thrower. Is he out of Finland? He's been putting a lot of stuff on. Gosh, I can't remember his name now. But he just, like, throws out in the fields. He's got some really great discus technique right now. Uh, women... I was very skeptical of what Maggie was going to be doing coming out of NCAA because I, I really did not like a lot of the stuff that she did. But as she progresses, I think that she is getting closer and closer to a really good mechanic. Uh, so I'm excited to see what, what she can do. Uh, offhand, I, I think that's about all I can speak of right now. Offhand. I wasn't prepared for that question. <laughs> I think those are the best questions. Uh, yeah. Sean, I don't know how to pronounce this. Ola, Ola Skunis, I don't know, from Norway. But, yeah, I know who you're talking about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, man. Well, I want to say thank you um, again for, for agreeing to do this. Everybody, um, if you have any other questions or contacts, if you um, take advantage of getting these slides from Justin, just make sure you reach out to him. And if it happens to go my way, I'll pass it along to Justin. And I think with that, we can probably roll into Miss Jennifer Joyce. Jen, are you available? Yeah, 